Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's In Conversation Live here at the Royal Society of Medicine. My name is Professor Henrietta Bowden-Jones, trustee of the RSM and president of psychiatry here. Tonight's guest is Professor Dame Jane Dacre. And before we begin, I would just like to encourage you, as I always do, to use a Q&A function. We have a lot of fun and there is a lot of activity and interaction. If you actually let go, use it, ask whatever question you want, and I'll make sure your questions get through to Jane. But for the moment, uh, welcome, Jane. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, reading out um, your biography. So Professor of Medical Education at UCL, former Director of UCL Medical School and past Medical Director of the MRCP UK exam, past President of the Royal College of Physicians from 2014 to 2018. She led the 2018 Gender Pay Gap in Medicine Review was appointed DBE in the 2018 Birthday Honours for Services to Medicine and Medical Education, recipient of numerous national and international prizes. Jane, uh, you're most welcome tonight. Lovely to see you. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. Great. So um, I'm going to start, instead of asking about your childhood straight away, I want to I want to understand with all the experience you've had, what you feel looking back on your career about the changes in terms of our profession, uh, the identity of doctors, what are we creating now? How do they, does it differ now in relation to some years ago? Um, well, I suppose I've been a doctor for a long time now. Um, and there are some things that have changed for the better and some things that maybe haven't changed for the better. Things that are better are the focus on patient safety, um, a focus on communication skills uh, of doctors. Do you know, when I first uh, did medical school exams, um, we never had to learn any communication skills. We were never taught any communication skills, so we didn't really have any. Well, some of us did, but that's because they were in age. So uh, that sort of thing has really improved. There have been extraordinary uh, changes in technology. Um, patients, when I was first a medical student with heart attacks or, or myocardial infarction, as it was, as it was even then known, uh, would come in and sit in hospital for a week. And we wouldn't really do very much. Some of them would die and some of them got better and went home. And then they came back again. Um, we didn't do much for stroke. So there are fantastic changes in medicine and medical technology uh, over the years. But there are some things that maybe for me haven't changed fast enough. Uh, I'm very passionate about medical education and the recognition of medical education. And I think that would be where I worry most about the slow progression of change in the profession. Because what we tend to do is value, um, knowledge, as opposed to the skill that, that doctors have. Um, and in education, uh, it's good to know a lot of stuff to be a doctor, but it's actually better to know how to be a doctor and how to care for patients. Mm. And although that has changed, it hasn't changed fast enough for me. The mm. other thing that's changed and it isn't fast enough is the, the way that we are not inclusive enough still in medicine. Um, when I was a trainee, there were uh, quotas in medical schools for the number of women that we were allowed to have. I was at UCH Medical School, we were allowed to have 30% women and I was one of those 30%. Uh, a few years after that, um, the Sex Discrimination Act happened in 1975. And so then medical schools had to take 50% women if 50% of, of women applied. Uh, and the rates went up to 50%, but those women um, have not reached the top of the profession in the way that you might have expected with the numbers going in. Jane, can I, that, I'm yeah. delighted that you've brought in the gender issues and we're going to go back and, and properly sort of delve into that slightly later on tonight. Um, but I just wanted to pick something else. We were allowed to have 30%. What does that mean? Does it mean that you had to have 30% or did it mean that if you went over 30, that wasn't allowed? What, what, what does that 30% mean? Well, 
um, when so when I went to medical school, which was just before the law changed, you were only allowed up to 30 uh, percent to enter into your class. So I was unbelievable. I had no idea. Yeah. And that was the same in most medical schools. I right. think the Royal Free was different. They had 50, but then they were meant to be a male medical school. Um, so they they uh, did have more women, um, but but UCH the quota was thirty percent, and some medical schools had lower quotas than that. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 there are sort of sinister echoes at some level of the recent events in Japan, when uh, we've all read in the papers about marks being taken away from women wanting to enter medical school. The big scandal that was uh, uncovered a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, in order to keep the quotas you know very very low um i don't know what number what percentages they have they had in japan obviously that will have changed recently with more scrutiny but that was a practice that was going on for a while so are we are we choosing the right people you talk about people skills um, empathy presumably is one of the big things emotional intelligence will be another we, we are we focusing a lot on academia and not enough on people skills what looking at the current lot coming in would you say that they are uh representatives of what what a good doctor should be um, I, I think it's difficult to tell when they when they come in at, at 18. Um, we do have data from from UCL Medical School, though, that the course is very academic. So you need to get lots of A's or lots of A stars at A level to get into medicine. And I would say that to pass a medical degree, you have to be very academic. I think it might be different to be a doctor. Um, so so yes to get into medical school and survive if you don't get three a stars at a level you're much more likely to have difficulty and you're much more likely to end up leaving leaving the course but whether you need those three a stars when you're going to be a doctor i think is probably a subject of, of more debate and you know of course we need more doctors in this country we're woefully short so actually there are an awful lot of people around mm. who have the skills to uh, be able to look after and, and support patients. Some of them might not get through medical school these days, but some of them might make very good doctors would be my, my personal view. Yes, yes. And we've got a few questions here. One we'll take later because it's about your precedency, but what uh, Robert Jones asks, what value do you place on pastoral services for medical students? Hugely important. Um, these are young people uh, who are leaving home, who are at a very difficult time in their lives. And well, um, Etta, you, you, you will know it's a time in, in young people's lives when things go wrong with their, with their well-being. Um, so it's hugely important to, to be able to look after the students. But there's a, real, there's a real dilemma here, which is that the students have the fear of God put into them about they really worry about declaring things that they think might count against them in medical school and, and yeah. that's quite an impediment to people coming forward with problems but certainly uh, at UCL when I was um, the, the director there and, and also now uh, we try and bend over backwards to support students through, through difficult times um, and the majority of people when they get it past the first couple of years at medical school will come out at, at the other end. And, and a lot of the um, support that they have is really necessary and hugely important. What do you feel are the biggest problems uh, medical students are facing when they get, uh, when they actually do come forward for help? And as you say, many will be reluctant to do so in fear that they might be deemed to be maybe not strong enough or resilient enough for the cause. Um, do you mean the, the, the sorts of things that they come forward yeah. with? What do they present? Yeah. So, well, exam stress is a is a big, big thing. Mm -hmm. um, there are some students who just find it really difficult to cope with the big class sizes, and uh, they've often been top of the class at school, and then they're average. Uh, and not everybody in medical school can be above average, although everybody was above average when they came. Um, so, so that that's yeah. difficult. I mean, interestingly, my impression is that we have quite a number of 
problems with eating disorders. I think that perhaps goes with high, high achieving people. And then there are the occasional students that actually have a psychotic episode or, or something does go really, really wrong in their life. Um, and then there are students he, who didn't really want to do it, who are not motivated. Mm -hmm. um, and we find that, that what happens is that those, those problems are not always uh, are not always declared by the students because of the things we talked about, but they will sometimes um, come to the fore when they start to do badly and they start to do badly in exams or they or they don't turn up. Yeah. So um, we have various surrogate markers of of how well uh, people are going to do and and attendance is one of them. Um, examination performance is another one. I mean, there was a, a, a a very amusing um, article in a Christmas BMA one year about a paediatrics attachment. And um, <laughs> what it did was ask students to send in a photograph of themselves before they went to the paediatrics attachment and correlated it with exam performance. Oh. And the students that couldn't get their act together to send in the photograph were more likely to fail the exam. So there are some oh, fascinating, yes. Well, I mean, and, and sort of later in the so great, <laughs> it's hard to know, but. Well, later in my career, I've done a lot on, on performance of doctors. I was involved in setting up the fitness to practice procedures for the GMC. So we looked at the performance of, of doctors later on in their careers. And um, the GMC staff behind the scenes always used to be able to tell who were the people that were going to be more, cause them more trouble. And they were people who, who uh, didn't reply to letters, uh, moved house an awful lot of times, and appeared to have a chaotic, uh, a chaotic way of living. So there's certainly something about uh, getting your act together. And yeah, sit. which could be a reflection of one's mental state, of course, not necessarily one's exe executive executive functioning abilities prior to the problems arising. Yeah. But yeah. that's yeah. fascinating. Awesome. We've got so many questions. I'm going to start asking you some. Uh, so Dilukshi Elegant Ratnam uh, says, do you feel that enough is being done to increase diversity amongst the medical student body? This is in terms of ethnic backgrounds and from lower socioeconomic economic backgrounds as well? Well, huge efforts are being made and there are targets, uh, but the results are not quite coming through in the way that we would necessarily like them to. So that I, I suppose reflects the fact that maybe enough isn't being done um, or what is being done isn't being hugely successful. When I did the first uh, work that I did in relation to women in medicine, we looked at uh, people who got GCSEs at, at age 15, and then looked at the percentage of those that went into medical school. And what the data shows, this is quite old now, it's from 2009, but what the data showed was that, um, white women get into medical school in proportion of the number who took GSEs, GCSEs. Uh, minority uh, ethnic, as in Asian women and men, got into medical school at above the percentage that they were taking GCSEs. Wow, yes. Black uh, people, got in, men and women, got into medical school in about the percentage that they were taking GCSEs, but there weren't very many of them. There aren't very many of them in that pool. And the group, interestingly, at that stage that was underrepresented was white boys. And it was thought at the time that white boys were interested in fast money, big jobs in the city. And then when the city bubble burst, everybody thought that that was going to change. Uh, I'm not aware that people have looked in the same way uh, since then. Oh, uh, this will be a very interesting piece of research. I can imagine. I'm ho hoping that tonight might inspire a new uh, a new bit of research after this uh, sharing of information. Because that was 2009, you said. So it was published. I think it was in yeah. 2009. We published yeah. it with the first yeah. report that I did for the College of Physicians on mm -hmm. 
in medicine. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So that that's how that's very helpful. I didn't know that. I'm learning so much from you. Um, uh, so Gillian Perry Keen, have things changed in the inter interaction and atmosphere since my attendance at UCH in 1963? when I was one of 10 women with 90 men. <laughs> yes, in terms of numbers, there are now about 50-50 at, at, at UCL Medical School. The national uh, numbers is actually 60-40 in favor of women. So you'd find more women around. Uh, have the attitudes changed? Most of the attitudes have changed. There are still uh, some sleepy backwaters where there are inappropriate things that uh, continue to be said to, well, all medical students, but in particular, uh, minority students and, and female students. And, and although we've made huge efforts to call it out and to stop it, what happens is it tends to drive it underground. So I would say things have changed significantly for the better, but the poor behaviors still haven't gone away. Mm. Still yeah. there. Yeah. Um, great. We've got Mabs Chowdhury wanting to know, how do we increase the medical workforce now? Overseas doctors are still very keen to come, uh, but perhaps to selected bigger centers is the question. Any thoughts? Well, um, I am... <laughs> doing my nut about trying to increase the size of the medical workforce and the, the problem with the size of the medical workforce in terms of people coming into medical schools and medical school places and also indeed the, the numbers of people in the workforce are that it's governed by the treasury not by the NHS. So we tend to get the number of uh, doctors that we can afford or that the country can afford, or the country thinks they can afford, rather than the number of doctors that the NHS thinks it needs. And I, and I was really saddened last week, actually, when Jeremy Hunt's amendment uh, to, the, to the, the new bill, the, the NHS or the health bill, didn't get past the House of Commons, because that was saying what we needed was an independent estimate uh, from an organisation of actually how many doctors we need, not a negotiation behind the scenes with the treasury that's a, that, that feels as if, as if it's a bit of a, a, a bartering deal about how many, how many can we have, how many can you afford, how many can we get? Because to me, that's not a way of increasing the medical workforce. And if you look at the data, we had a lot of data from the College of Physicians from the workforce uh, units, there are a number of jobs, and I think it's now more than 50% of jobs that, that uh, are advertised in parts of the country, mainly uh, away from London, so in, in the, the, the corners of the country, um, where the posts go unfilled because of a lack of suitable applicants. Yeah. So they are woefully short. Yeah. Jane, uh, go back to Jeremy Hunt for a second. It seems to me that approaching the uh, lack of doctors with an evidence based uh, uh, research uh, appro approach is the obvious thing to do. Why do you think, uh, you know, after all, we know we have less doctors per capita than, than a lot of other countries. Admittedly, some countries might have too many. But, um, you know, if you had to predict uh, how much how much lower our work was, uh, workforce was, would you know? And why do you think it was turned down? It makes no sense. I think it was possibly, well, it's politics. It's to do with um, whipping and voting and the way uh, that things work in, in Parliament, because one of the really fascinating things about it was that Jeremy Hunt, surprisingly, amazingly, managed um, to unite the profession uh, because all of the medical royal colleges uh, joined in um, and, a, and several other NHS think tanks and NHS providers and all sorts of people said, look, come on government, this is a really good idea. We support this, we want this to happen, um, but it didn't get through. It's gonna go and be discussed in the Lords. So everybody out there, please, if you get a chance, we need more doctors. We really need more doctors. We need more medical students. Absolutely. Absolutely. Get more people in. 
Yeah, there's a question from Dominic um, Elder Takat saying, do you think that there will be significant numbers of clinical practitioners other than doctors, like physician associates or nurse practitioners, alongside doctors in the future, uh, rather than the ever striving need to increase these numbers? Uh, yes. Uh, that, so when I was uh, president of the College of Physicians, we set up the Faculty of Physician Associates. And uh, the, the physician associates are fantastic because they're the only, well, because they're good and they're really helpful and they really support doctors who work with them, but they're the only new profession in town. So uh, everybody else that's doing work, the work of a doctor is being taken from another professional group that we're also short of. So physician associates are a genuine addition to the workforce. And the numbers uh, that were being approved in medical schools were going up and up and up. So absolutely, the numbers are, are increasing hugely. So the problem in all of that is that they're not yet regulated. Yeah. Because they're not regulated, um, they can't order x-rays or prescribe drugs. So they would be so much more uh, value to the workforce if they were regulated. The, another problem with them is that they, they come from, because they're not regulated, they come from universities and, and it's hard to get uh, equivalents across different university curricula. So um, it, it's, it's difficult to, to be absolutely sure with an unregulated profession whether the, the standards are equivalent from different, from different places. Yeah. But in, in the future, absolutely a fantastically able and welcome um, group to join the workforce and help us. And there, there was some concern from trainees, from junior doctors, that, they, that there would be competition for training placements, for teaching time. I have to say, my view is, come on, guys, there just are not enough of us. Anybody who's going to, willing to come in and help look after the patients is actually should be really welcomed. Yeah, yeah. Can I go? Can I we'll come back? There are more questions about all this, uh, but let's talk about you for a second. So how, tell us about you as a child. How old were you when the idea of becoming a doctor first came to your mind? And were you growing up in a medical family? So, so my father was a doctor um, and at the age of 12, for a reason that I can't fathom and do not understand at all, I one day said I was going to be a doctor <laughs> and I have no idea why. Uh, but fortunately, it worked out because it fitted relatively well with my with my skill mix. <laughs> I was uh, the, the only girl in a family of four children. Um, so I had three brothers and, and I, I often reflect that perhaps one of the secrets of me um, managing to survive and thrive in a, a profession that was when I came into it completely male dominated was that I spent my early childhood fighting with three boys. And I'm still <laughs> doing it. I'm still doing it. <laughs> Your skill set sharpened. So, um, what, so what sort of journey was it? Was it, uh, you know, was it, a, you've risen right to the top, you know, president of the Royal College of Physicians. Uh, what sort of journey was it in terms of any obstacles? Do you want to share some of it with, with people listening? So ups and downs, I would say. <laughs> Medical school, I suppose the main problem was the problems that we've uh, we've talked about already about being top of the class at school and not being top of the class at medical school. Um, then uh, maybe the biggest hurdle that uh, that I had and had to overcome was having children. It's fine for women without children to do the same jobs as as the men do, but once you start to have children, life becomes increasingly complicated. So my first uh, pregnancy, my, my first childbirth was a complete disaster. I, I was not cut out for childbirth at all and became extremely unwell. And I was on uh, soft money. I was doing a, a research post. And in those days, uh, I didn't get maternity leave. And um, I lost my job when I had my child because I couldn't come back to work 
quickly enough. Uh, and I then had to scrabble around trying to find something to do. And, and in a way that spurred me on because one of the things that being one of four children does to you is that you have a keen sense of injustice. <laughs> and so I, I was determined to get back in. So, so then, uh, interestingly, and I, I recently reflected on this, I did a senior registrar job as a job share. Uh, and we were the first, uh, we were the first job share but uh, I think in medicine in the country. Wow. And you, you won't believe this, but, but really bizarrely, the person who I shared my job with was Tim Spector of the Zoe app. And Tim and I got together one day and said, you know, this is ridiculous. Tim wanted to do research and I had children and was still doing my research. And we both wanted to cut down the amount of on-call we did. And I was always much more interested in the clinical side of things. I was very much a born again physician and Tim wasn't. So we shared this job <clears throat> and we both got absolutely what we wanted out of it. Mm. When we went on to become, uh, to become consultants, uh, I opted to go part-time because by then I had two children under the age of three and uh, it was hard work. And um, Tim's quote that he, probably doesn't remember but really is seared on my memory is one day he he and I were sitting down discussing our, our jobs and our role um, and he said Jane it's time you became a full-time skyver rather than a part-time martyr he says you work all the time just so that you can look after your children and, and essentially what he was saying to me was uh, be proud of who you are and what you're doing don't martyr yourself just because you have to go and do the shopping or pick the children up one or two days a week. Just take the time off. Yeah. Stop worrying about it. And I have to say that stuck in my mind. And, and thank you, Tim. You changed my life. <laughs> Incredible, isn't it? And you and you think that was probably the first job show. Did you have to fight for it? Um, well, at the time, we were both, uh, I think, research registrars. Yeah. And we just pretended we were one person. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I can't quite work out uh, yeah. how it happened, but sort of thinking back, I, I mean, I suspect it means that both of us were quite driven and prepared to, to stick our heads above the yeah. water uh, and take the risk in order to, to, to go to the next stage of our career. And it, it worked really well. Excellent. Now, I want to move on to the gender pay gap review. But before I do that, tell us uh, just briefly whether you have any uh, mentors you want to mention on this uh, interview and also um, any role models. So formal uh, mentors, I, I've never had a formal mentor, um, although I've had a huge number of, of role models. Um, I think my standout role model has got to be Parveen. Parveen. <laughs> yeah, mine too. <laughs> um, I, was, I was a medical registrar. Uh, in fact, I was just starting as a medical registrar at the old Hackney Hospital. And along came Parveen. And here was this woman from a minority group. She had small children. She was a consultant physician and gastroenterologist. And she had it all. And I just thought, okay, this is, this is possible. We can do this. Um, and so Parvin is now a great friend and is a wonderful woman and has the most extraordinary life story. So, so she would be my, my standout role model. Then, of course, there are other uh, female physicians. Uh, Margaret Turner Warwick was the first, or in fact, the, my two predecessors as women at the College of Physicians. Mm. Extraordinary that in 500 years of an organisation, they've only had three women presidents. Uh, the first one, Margaret Turner Warwick, who, who sadly died uh, a few years ago now, was an extraordinary woman who didn't have any truck with all these special favours for women. If you were good enough, you'd be there. And if you weren't good enough, you wouldn't be there. I'm not sure I agree with her. And then also Carol Black, um, who has the most extraordinary intellectual ability and uh, was driven to to move things forwards and, and get things done. So so those would be my 
uh, female role models. Great, great yeah. names, great names. And of course, Carol's still extremely yeah, active, still active, driving still active. things uh, as we speak. Um, so thank you for sharing those. They're very personal stories and uh, and I'm delighted we, we made time for that. So uh, let me just move on to the gender pay gap. It was 2018 um, and published in 2020. So you had those years of um, working extremely hard. I remember, of course, because we were, you know, MWF and uh, trying to support you in every way we could. Um, and the numbers, the sheer numbers of doctors who were uh, interviewed and who participated. I've got here 86,000 consultants, 16,000 GPs, 4,500 clinical academics. I think these are correct numbers. Anyway, an enormous amount. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what had the, you know, the main findings maybe if you will, or, or some thoughts on, on the work that you did and how it, how it began and, 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 and how yeah. it was that you took it on? So um, bizarrely, um... And again, uh, I'm crediting Jeremy Hunt. You, you wouldn't quite believe that you would hear me do that because he and I were real sparring partners yes. when uh, I was the college president. Mm -hmm. But what happened was uh, he did, um, he, he visited, he, he used to go and visit trusts because he wanted to look at, at patient safety, he got very interested in it. And, and I was involved in visiting some trusts with him. And I, and I, uh, I don't know. Well, we had a conversation, a robust conversation uh, about um, about women in medicine because it was one of my areas of interest. And and one of the things that had come out of of the junior doctors strike was that there was an equalities impact assessment done in rather a hurry because they had forgotten to do it at the beginning, as far as I can work out, that showed that there could be an impact of the imposition of the doctor's uh, contract, junior doctor's contract on the gender pay gap. And uh, so as part of trying to get this deal through, he agreed to have a gender pay gap review. Um, and he then forgot about it. And when he was chatting to me in, on this road trip that we were doing, he suddenly realized that I was interested in gender. So. He rang me up and said, you wouldn't like to lead this, would you? And so I said, well, yes, absolutely, uh, because it's really important. Mm -hmm. And we were incredibly fortunate to interview and appoint Carol Woodhams and her yeah. team from uh, Surrey University. And Carol has got the most incredible grasp of all of this and is a huge intellect in relation to doing all this in enormous number crunching task, cleaning and crunching data from NHS Digital. Uh, because we, uh, it was done under the auspices of the Department of Health, we had incredible access. Um, so we had access to the electronic staff record. Uh, we had access to HESA data for clinical academics. We had access to uh, medical school data. And when we couldn't get access, so we couldn't get access for GPs because their salaries are not in in the uh, electronic staff record, although some of their demographic details are. We then got access to the tax office, to self-assessment tax forms. And we were able to uh, join those two together with some help of, with the help of some very clever statisticians from the LSE and, and Surrey uh, University. And, and every step of the way, actually, we're hugely grateful to organizations like the MWF and the BMA who, who fed into the, the data and the work as it, as it came out. Um, and the work was finished actually quite a long time before 2020. Mm -hmm. But if you remember, we were going through a period of uh, what, what I would call a surfeit of political change. Uh, there were general elections, there were new prime ministers, there were new ministers, and it was, it was real churn at the top. Yeah. And so that churn, and then of course there was Brexit, yeah. and Brexit kept moving, and every time Brexit moved, the date of publication moved. Um, so eventually we just got it under the wire uh, before um, Christmas in 2020 to yeah. get it published. 
to, you know, it was a bit low profile, but we were desperate to get it out there before it became out of date because we felt it would undermine the findings if it if it absolutely and talking about the findings jane um results like male gps earn a third more than female gps um you know why is that and uh even after taking into consideration hours worked you've got discrepancies of between 12 and 19 percent in the salaries of uh, of male and female doctors um any any anything you want to say about <laughs> lots lots how long have you got how long have you got um some of the gp stuff is actually a bit unfair uh, because in the gp data set that we had um it it was wasn't very easy it isn't very easy to count hours worked by gps so it was harder to work out who was part time and who was full time so if you do that quite carefully that gp number comes down to about 15% but in most professions, in most single professions, uh, like the civil service, the, the gender pay gaps are between six and eight percent. So in medicine, 15 percent is stonkingly large. Yeah. So um, you wonder why. And what they did, what the researchers did using very clever statistical techniques was they kept putting um, potential causes into the hopper to try and to try and bring that pay gap down. And it, the lowest it got to was about was about 15 percent um and the causes that we knew about are that uh men tend to be older in a profession men have reached more senior positions in a profession and in some surgical specialties for example urology that that brought the unadjusted uh, pay gap up to about 40 percent so surgical specialties had real problems because they've got large numbers of old men, older men, shouldn't be ageist. Um, and and uh, specialties that had more women tended to have lower pay gaps. So uh, the, 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 the makeup of the specialty was important. Um, people who worked in London had lower pay gaps. Uh, and that's partly because of gaming. And so one of the things that was interesting is that uh, a, clinical excellence awards go to men, uh, mainly though, because men apply more. So uh, women don't apply. Is it because they're not encouraged to apply or is it because they don't have the confidence to, imply, to apply? That's something we need to look at. An extraordinary thing was that uh, extra payments for extra work are more likely to go to men than women. Yeah. And one of the things that's really interesting about that is that the extra work that men like to do tends to be uh, either surgical catch up waiting lists or dealing with finance or being a medical director, um, which is remunerated. The extra work that women do is nurturing, mentoring, educating, and the, the women's approach to that is, well, I'm very lucky to be able to do it. So there are different approaches and different cultures. Fascinating to hear. And of course, the next steps, I suppose, on our way to sorting it out will be to recognise the time spent and, and, and remunerate it accordingly. Uh, but I, I do remember the issue of uh, clinical excellence awards and women just not, not applying as much um, in terms of numbers. Now, David Cochran says, any thoughts on distinction awards and seniority payments? I think we've sort of answered that now uh, but if there's anything else on that now would be a good time um, well there is a review uh there's a review going on and there's some um so following our review and i think what they're planning on doing is changing the fields uh so that it isn't so heavily weighted and things that men are more likely to to gain points in um, and they're also working more uh, with, with uh, trusts and they're changing the structure, I think, or they're proposing to change the structure so you don't have to go through the ranks with the clinical excellence awards and then measuring the outcome in terms of, of gender, but also in terms of ethnicity. So work is ongoing, yeah. sparked by the gender pay gap review, yeah. which, is, which is really good news. Excellent. Well, thank you so much from all of us for having done that. I know how all consuming it was during those years, uh, you and the team. Um, let us get on to asking you about your presidency now, Jane. Um, 
you had these four years, as you said earlier, only the third female president. I was going to ask you about your pre, you know, your predecessors, the, the two women. You've you've spoken about that, uh, but maybe uh, some thoughts about those years um, and uh, you know, any any with hindsight, anything that uh, you you've kept, that you, good memories and bad memories, maybe. <laughs> Well, good memories mainly, um, an enormous privilege to be elected by your peers and to, to lead uh, one of the oldest medical royal colleges, um, the oldest in England. Uh, and one of the highlights for me was that, that we had our 500th anniversary in the last year of my presidency, so that was lovely. Um, one of the fantastic legacies which I can't claim to be my own, but came out of my own president, is the um, new RCP building in Liverpool. Um, if anybody wants to go and have a look at it, it's, it's fantastic, it's the most beautiful building. Uh, that came out of, you know, I was, actually my daughter, my youngest daughter was doing a project about elephants and it was around about New Year and it was a couple of years before our 500th anniversary. And, and um, I was, she was writing something about elephants for her coursework. And I was sitting there thinking, okay, what can we do? What can we do to really mark this 500th anniversary? And it came to me that we should have a building for fellows and members that celebrates them and celebrates education and is in a part of the country where fellows are under, underserved. And we went through a due diligence and ran a project and, um, a long story short, we did a deal with Liverpool um, and it, amazingly that building now exists. It's called the Spine. Uh, if you want to have a look at it, there are lots of pictures of it uh, on the internet and the locals call it the giraffe. <laughs> um, and the reason is that the, we had an architectural exhibition to design the building um, and we wanted uh, that the architects that, that came up with the spine wanted the staircases from the outside to look like a spinal column because mm. of the thing. And the glass had some special glass chips put in it to make it look like squamous epithelium. So it was going to be... <laughs> was that if you looked at it from a distance, this very tall building right at the top of Liverpool with fantastic views looks like a giraffe. That's a funny story. I, I, I will absolutely Google that the minute we finish. Thank you for sharing. And uh, so talking of art then, just before I move on to more serious topics, um, I do remember the big ceremony at the RCP, uh, the unveiling of this uh, beautiful portrait. Who was the artist who did your portrait and how did it feel having that sort of immortal, having yourself immortalized on a canvas? It, it feels a bit freaky. Um, and the artist was a guy called Paul Benny. And um, the reason why he was selected was because he had a history uh, with the College of Physicians because his father had been a silversmith and had made some pieces that were in the college collection. Um, the, the, the portrait painted is really odd, makes you feel weird. And then when you look at it, you think, oh God, I don't really look like that. And then you realize that you do. Um, and one of the things about the portrait, which sort of made me feel slightly more comfortable about it, is that it felt as if it wasn't about me, it was about a celebration of 500 years of the college, because it was in that year. And so um, he picked up things from paintings of the time. Um, Holbein was, the, was the, 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 the painter of the time, and he painted a lot of uh, he said people that had the same colouring as me, and I think that's because of the sort of southern European princesses. And so, so he chose the colours of the background to look like that, and uh, the, the posture reflected that. And then what he also did was put um, the college crest up in the corner of the painting to show that that was the house that I belonged to because that was what that was all portrait painters um, did in those days. 
uh, I have to say now when I go into the college and I see this huge thing of me standing there, I look down and <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. He did a really good job. Now, talking of the college, there was, there must have been, and I don't want you to obviously to go into detail and letting us know stuff you don't want to share, but you know, politics and medicine at the levels you were working at go hand in hand, don't they? I'm not talking necessarily big politics, Jeremy Hunt doing this and that with you, but, you know, internal medical politics. So how, yeah. how was it? Were you prepared for it because you'd worked, had you always wanted to become president and you sharpened your political skills or did you learn them on the job? Tell us a bit about that. Uh, I was completely naive. Uh, I knew that there would be difficult things, but I didn't know what they were going to be. Um, and I actually found the, the politics, both internal and politics with a big P, absolutely fascinating because it was a new way of doing things. It was a new way of, of uh, making things happen and um, working, working with colleagues. And there were some hugely difficult times. Um, some of those times became more difficult after I left. Some of those times became easier after I, after I left. Um, one of the things that, that is uh, difficult for all Royal College presidents is the relationship um, between the, the colleges and the devolved nations. So that was, a, that was a huge source of tension a lot of the time and has been for pretty much every Royal College president, particularly for the physicians and surgeons, and that, that was unexpected and, and difficult. And then, of course, there were some difficult things that we had to debate. Um, the junior doctors' industrial action was really hard because, on the one hand, we wanted to be able to still uh, be at the table with the big boys in politics, in parliament, and on the other hand, we were horrified at the way our trainees felt and felt that they needed to be supported and motivated and that was a very difficult line to tread. Um, another thing that was really really awful <clears throat> when the registrar uh, rang me up one evening and said are you sitting down um, and what he told me was when I don't know whether people remember and I hope you forget it all really quickly that somebody had mis misaligned a spreadsheet and given out uh, erroneous job applications to thousands of oh my goodness <laughs> and that was just awful. Yeah. and it was my brother's birthday and I was was going away for the weekend and I I got called back um to to try and deal with the fallout of, of this and actually it taught me a huge amount, um, not least about humility and about recognizing when you've messed up, about taking the blame for an organization when actually, you know, I didn't even know it was going on, but it was my fault because I was in charge. And then having to be interviewed about it on the Today program the following morning. <laughs> That sounds really painful. Um, we've got Dr. We've got Dr. Addy. Um, it's a very long question. I'm not going to read it all. But essentially, how important is networking and nepotism, if I read the question correctly, in relation to making it to the top in medical precedencies? Not not yours necessarily, but in general. Nepotism, for me, no, and in general, no. Uh, networking, absolutely, you, you, you have to be respected by your colleagues, so your colleagues need to know you to be able to learn whether or not they <clears throat> respect you. So <clears throat> in the medical royal colleges, much less so now, uh, there has been a tradition of it being an old boys network. And there are still some corners where um, there is an old boys network. And that's not to diss those people who are hugely loyal and have done an enormous amount for the organization. But uh, one of the things that I very firmly believe is that the college is, is its members. And the vast majority of the members of the college are a different demographic um, from that group. Therefore, the balance of power is slowly moving away. Um, and that's very difficult for people from whom that power is moving. 
um, and that becomes difficult. But I, I would say, I don't believe that it's nepotistic. Uh, I think that, uh, I suppose I started it because I was a woman and, and, and that was why it started. But I think the college's uh, efforts into developing a more equal and inclusive organization uh, after my departure have been extraordinary and hugely well received. And I'm so proud of the college and my successors uh, who, who've done that. I, I really feel that they've made uh, enormous strides. Yeah, and so, so this leads me on to my next question really. What, looking back on your career, do you think will be the greatest legacy you will have left behind? <laughs> well, in terms of size, it's the giraffe. <laughs> Well, that's it. You've answered the question. <laughs> In terms of the college, I would hope, I would hope that I started to turn the tiller on being an inclusive organisation. Yeah. yeah, beautiful, beautiful answer. So uh, we've got a little bit of time left, not too long. I want to go back to some of the many questions in the chat, but I... I want to ask you, considering the times we've been working in over the last couple of years, in your opinion, how accountable are doctors when working in pressurised and extreme circumstances, such as COVID moments when staff was low, morale was low, equipment wasn't there, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure what you mean by accountable. Um, I suppose um, there were plenty of moments in the last in the last couple of years when people felt that they couldn't do their job as well because yeah. you know or or they they feared you know maybe they feared proximity with patients or maybe they feared getting onto the ward and they might you know so accountability in relation or maybe even looking at systems you know when systems fail because there aren't enough people you know doing the job and you end up covering for people and feeling exhausted there's a lot in the bmj at the moment about you know should you actually do the extra on call because otherwise who's going to do it and there may be short yeah. or should you put yourself out there yes well i uh i love doctors all doctors. I think doctors are extraordinary people. And I think that they get up in the morning with a core set of values, which is to support and help people. And uh, that's the most extraordinary thing about uh, the people in the College of Physicians, that there are not any of them who don't have that at their core. But I think what happened during COVID was that the system didn't always, uh, didn't, didn't always stand up for the doctors and so and so people uh, were put under extraordinary pressure um, and felt very scared and uh, felt as if they weren't being looked after and they weren't being nurtured and I think it is the job of the leadership of the profession to call that out yeah to be helpful and to speak truth to power mm -hmm. uh, so when things are going wrong if you're in a leadership position you have to be able to tell the truth to those that have the opportunity to put it right. And, and you have to do that uh, on behalf of those people that you represent. Mm. Um, and uh, I think the majority of the medical leaders did their best, but it was under extremely difficult circumstances. Nobody knew what was gonna happen next. Nobody knew what was right. Uh, and so people had to delve into their own resources and their own conscience to keep themselves going. But yeah. the profession um, have done an extraordinary job and I'm hugely proud of, it, of everybody who worked in it, those on the front line, but those that went and gave vaccinations, those that were doing endless remote uh, clinics to keep the show on the road I think it was just an extraordinary effort yeah uh, yeah absolutely I fully agree with that and do you think that we will see changes in the rates of applications for medical school following what was clearly a national um, rise in the profile of of our profession and we already have mm -hmm. we already have uh, well for a number of reasons one is the Gavin Williamson effect which is that people didn't do exams. 
Um, and so the numbers of applicants have gone up and the number of successful <laughs> has gone up. So the number coming into the early years, uh, the numbers are huge. We've got a massive bumper crop, yeah. which is great. And the government last year said, well, that's fine. We'll let them all in because normally school numbers are capped. So, you know, slightly cheekily, I think. Yes. By hook or by crook, we'll get more doctors in. A, a lucky generation <laughs> of doctors. Now, yeah, I've got a few. Good. I've got great compliments from a, a, a from a Mavs Chowdhury saying we UK colleagues love the skin theme of the RCP Liverpool building. <laughs> no guess for our specialty. So I think that's that's rather lovely. And then uh, someone else, Dr. Adi, saying thank you for enli your enlightening answer. And sorry, my question was so long. Um, We've got Solvita Alsena saying, how, um, how would you suggest empowering the position of uh, female junior doctors? Any advice? Uh, well, I think they need to be supported. Uh, and sometimes more senior female doctors are not as supportive as perhaps they could be towards their juniors. So, so I would say... Uh, it's always easy to support people if you get to know them. So I would say to the senior doctors, get to know your female senior doctors, and to the female senior doctors, get to know your juniors. Um, because if you know somebody, at the end of the day, us doctors are all incredibly similar in our core value set. I've examined, I've been fortunate to examine in all sorts of places all over the world for, for the MRCP, and you get your two physicians together over a patient with something wrong with them and within about 30 seconds you're speaking the same language so you need to find that connection people talk about the international language of football it's nothing to the international language of medicine if you find your wavelength with another doctor that you're able to talk to then you can support them and help them and trust them and be loyal to them and it's fantastic mm. thank you and um uh in the last few minutes, Jane, uh, and uh, and some of the things you're saying are very powerful. I'm glad we are recording this. I think we <laughs> I can then say, you want to hear something inspirational, just listen to that YouTube lecture. So uh, I will do that. Um, so I'm just trying to squeeze in really one last um, topic, if I may. Um, your role at the Medical Protection Society. I was just interested in you sharing a little bit about that with us and, uh, and, and the value of that to our profession, really. So, so um, I am the president of the, of the Medical Protection Society. So it's an interesting role as president because essentially the medical indemnity organizations are part of the financial services, they're insurance uh, people. And my uh, worry at the time, after the Junior Doctors Industrial Action, um, after my time at the presidency, is that who is there to put an arm round these doctors that are, that are, are feeling um, vulnerable at the moment? And it seemed to me that, that the medical indemnity organizations were in a very good place to do that, but their focus for all sorts of, of um, complicated reasons to do with high finance, which is really important, had been on the high finance. And uh, my motivation was to try and get them to understand clinicians better, uh, to understand the needs, the wants, the worries, the concerns of, of doctors and to support them and help them to, to do a good job and to protect them. Mm -hmm. that that was my motivation for for, for yeah. doing that yeah yeah thank you okay two very brief uh things uh claire gerardo recently published her memoirs uh, are you going to do the same <laughs> i don't think anyone would want to read it <laughs> very dull it would be very dull i tell you what though do you know what my husband uh worked for was the editor of itn at a time when a whole load of interesting things that were happening. And so if I published my memoirs, I'd actually call it the editor's wife. <laughs> because during my early years as a consultant, things happened in the world that threw my life into total chaos. 
Um, and I always thought was that was much more interesting than my own story of my own career. Oh, that's very... The, the Zeebrugge ferry disaster, various wars in various countries, elections, the death of Princess Diana, and all of those things completely screwed up my childcare. Yeah. So, so a, me a medical memoir via uh, the history of ITN, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, an, that's an interesting take. Um, now, my last thing before we finish, uh, I saw when I was looking through the thought, sort of questions I might ask you, that you were a judge on the International Prize for Poetry and Medicine. Yes. And a, I didn't know it existed, and B, is it still going? People might be very interested in reading some of these poems. Yes, and in fact, this year, I've just been sent, it's run by Donald Singer. Ah. And this year, I've just been sent a compilation of, of essays and poetry. So yes, still going strong. And every year they, they have, um, poetry people and also medics that that uh, that judge how wonderful and and it would will normally would there be a a, a face to, a real life meeting or is this done uh, yes the, yeah. there's a there's an event um that that where the prizes are given out yes excellent so well do let him know that we've discussed this and there are you know a lot of people who now know about it who may not have known and on that artistic note i think uh, we'll finish here i uh, let me if you give me a moment to do some housekeeping i will come back and thank you formally in a second of course. Uh, so first of all thank you to everybody for being so engaged and asking so many things i'd like to remind people that these events are free and the rsm as an educational establishment uh, really welcomes donations from you very easy to do there's a massive qr code on the uh, on the front page of the seminar so do do donate if you feel you would like to uh, secondly there are some really interesting future events coming up we've got the sarah hughes memorial lecture given by the very famous Jed Mercurio that you'll know as TV writer and director and medic. Um, so that's coming up on Friday. Uh, on Monday, the 6th, is the evening on loneliness and the human mind that I've organized and it will bring art, politics and medicine together. Uh, so I hope to see you there. And on Wednesday, the 8th, next week, uh, the, the next uh, In Conversation Live will be um, uh, Professor Sir Simon Wesley interviewing Andy Burnham. Uh, uh, so, so, so that's really good. That's all about to happen. And remember the feedback. Feel free to give uh, positive and negative feedback on your forms. We welcome it. Any new ideas for, spe for speakers as well and people to be interviewed. OK, and remember, you can join the RSM if you're not a member. We'd love to have you. So on that note, I'd like to thank you, Jane, again for your time tonight. And thank you for being a great um, uh, audience this evening. And uh, uh, I look forward to seeing you very soon. Bye bye. Thank you very much.